Okay. Welcome to the Racing Nuggets podcast. I'm PJ Noodleman, and our guest this week is Charlie Menard. It's been a while, Charlie. Good to see you. It's good to see you. Yeah, I've um, I've been too long it's between seeing you and and Toby. I sure uh, I sure miss you guys, and uh, appreciate all the history for sure. Well, that's kind of something I wanted to talk about a little bit today. Was that history? When you first started racing, it wasn't with Toby right away. What what did you actually get behind the wheel and race first? I, um, I tell you what, we started racing, we being myself and and really a couple of members of my family started racing go-karts back in like the early 80s, late 70s. And um, we built a go-kart track here at the at the complex uh, where our headquarters is and started racing go-karts. It's an, I really was a road racing guy between go-karts and ice racing and got into IMSA and Firehawk and, and that kind of racing. And I didn't race an oval, anything oval until we raced a legend car late nineties, mid to late nineties. Um, so really my background was, was all, uh, all road cars racing, which is totally different than racing short tracks in Wisconsin, but yeah, but yeah. a lot of fun in, in a different way. So did your dad race? When he was a kid, or how did you guys actually start? Get, no, I mean, I know your uncle John is involved in racing, but yeah, but did but, your dad? Our, race? our family was, um, you know, my my dad and John are one of eight kids, um, two of eight kids, I guess, and and they're farmers. They didn't, they didn't have any money to go raise, and they didn't have any money to do anything. And um, through the success of the company, once it got going, um, there was kind of this bug that that got um, uh, out that. Uh, um, John wanted to build this 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 go kart track. Um, Herm Johnson um, raced an Indy car with some sponsorship from Menards in the late seventies, and he got us going on racing go karts and things. But 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 when Herm started racing for Menards, um, that was like the first venture into racing. So it was not something that that came from you know many years of going to races in the past. It's something that was relatively new. Um, to my generation really and and uh kind of got going my dad raced some once we got going he raced go karts john raced go karts I, I was a teammate to john raced in ice racing cars but um for the most part that first generation didn't race very much and paul and i were really the ones that that did the heavy lifting of racing in our family <laughs> the heavy lifting i love it <laughs> when did you know when you were behind the wheel of whatever division it was when did you know this is what I want to do. This is mm -hmm. fun. I'm good. I can do this. Um, go kart racing for sure. So I would say mid eighties, we started traveling, doing traveling kart racing and very competitive kart racing. We had some great guys helping us. Um, uh, the Burgess family, um, some like Andy's brother, Andy Burgess's brother, Paul, he was big into kart racing. He got us into good equipment and I'd say to us, it was myself. And then, and then Paul, as Paul got a little bit older, um, we started traveling racing and, and we did really well, um, kart racing and, and all over the Midwest. And th at that point it was really fun and the technical side really enjoyed. And then, um, you know, just being competitive and, and winning obviously is, is a good time too, but that's where we got into the aspect of being a community around racing as well. Getting to know people that you're raced with, um, traveling these circuits and being with these people week after week. Uh, that was the other fun side of racing. So it was socially, uh, great and that competitive itch, you know, we are a very competitive family and, um, that was certainly a, a part of it as well. But I'd say the mid eighties, when we started kart racing, to answer your questions, when we really got going. Cool. So when you were doing legends, what was it that was the springboard then for you to move from legends to oval track with like a super light model? It's um, I, it's it's all Andy Burgess's fault, and I love Andy. Uh, you know Andy well. <laughs> um, we were racing legend cars, and again, Paul and I, and Paul we started racing a little bit of uh, stock car stuff with uh, Refners, um, and then. Um, Andy got me into uh ASA car with Rick Scalzo's team and Toby was the crew chief down in Cedar Rapids. So I went from a legend car to a V6 ASA car, never driving a, a, a late model in between. And we went down there and we were competitive. Um, but Andy's the one that architected the whole thing and got me hooked up with Rick and Toby and, and got us going. But um, we did, we did decent race in that car. We finished the race. Um, all, all the fenders are on it. I, I found some pictures the other day of us down there. It's fun memories. And uh, then we kind of took a step back saying, this ASA racing is fun, but boy, that's a big jump. And then started doing some of the, the lacrosse stuff from there. And and as you know, you know, Toby's a master down there. And, and 
we didn't get to Toby right away. We had a little bit of period of, of having some other folks work on the car and, and, and do that. But then when Toby and I hooked up, you know, obviously the rest is, is a bit history. We can talk about that, but, um, um, that was a, that was a big jump from ASA from to the SA cars from the legend cars and, and one that went a little bit too quick. And then, and then we figured it out. <laughs> so what was your biggest challenge when you made that transition to those ASA cars? Um, just, just probably the competitiveness of it and the um and the, just the uh, technical side of it the legend cars you could base once we got our setup figured out you could probably take that car almost anywhere and, and be good and we had a we had a good legends program put together um, we knew where we could push and 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 prod on the rules and and uh we had you know uh, pete burgess andy's brother helps us work on the the cars not many guys had full-time mechanics working on the legend cars you know paul and i were pretty lucky that way but um when you get to the next level a lot of people had a lot of resources and it was really really competitive and not that that was a bad thing that was just a big jump that was a, a big step up that it was hard to be we were used to being pretty dominant at, at legend car races we were pretty humble <laughs> um mm. going to, to some of the asa stuff for sure so what was that like? And I know this sounds a little odd, me asking yeah. you since I'm married to the guy, but <laughs> what was that like for you when you first started working with Toby? Was your communication kind of what you needed it to be or how long did it take for you two to gel? Um, I, I'm trying to recall how we did that program exactly because I raced one or two races with Toby um, in the ASA stuff. And then we had a period that we raced some other, um, the new car, the, the V8 car for a little bit in some races. And then... I think Toby and I went separate ways and I late model race and my, and we didn't gel because it was really kind of a renter ideal when I was first with Toby. So it was more like, and Toby had been through a lot of different guys that way, you know, he, him and Steve had a quite a connection, but then when he's Holshausen, yeah. When, when, and then when him and um, Rick Scalzo, when we were for Rick Scalzo, he had a ton of different drivers in those cars. So I don't think Toby ever gave me, um, the time of day and not in a, in a rude way, but I was just another mm. guy kind of coming through and, and, and doing a rent to ride thing. When, when we came back together and we started racing at lacrosse weekly and riding in the truck down to the lacrosse speedway and back and spending hours and hours together, that's when we clicked. I mean, that's when you talked to everything from, from life to what's the car doing going into the corner and what's the feeling you're looking for. And, and how do you race? How do you race an oval car? How do you, uh, my best story of Toby always is, is, teaching me to pass people on the outside, you know, road racing, you drive, you dive in on a guy, you drive underneath them and, and you kind of get up underneath them and come off the corner. Toby always was, um, um, pushing me to, to run the outside of the corner. And we would talk about that though. It wasn't that he just mentioned it to you and, and go on, but we'd ride in the truck for a couple hours together, going to the track, come home from the track. We talk about, about what we need to be to be successful. And so when we started uh, late mile racing at lacrosse, that's when we really bonded. And, and through that process, then he came to work for us full time. And, and we got, I mean, we still are really good friends and, and that's what happens mm -hmm. with crew, crew chief relationships. You know, that's all of a sudden you can just kind of grunt and he kind of snorts and you know what, what to do, but that's, that's tough to do. And that, that takes a lot of time. That, and, and it's a relationship, you know, and that, like I said, yeah. that wasn't right away though. That was, that was years after I got, first met Toby in that first ASA race for sure. What did you think of him when you first saw him? Because I think most people don't know what to think because he's not as <laughs> polished. And, this is not uh, insulting at all, but Toby's a pig farmer, you know, I mean, that's, <laughs> and, and, and I love him for it. And I, and I love his family and I've been to the farm and, and, and really got to grow, you know, with him and, and seeing that, but yeah, no, he's not a polished guy, but, but as soon as you start talking to him, he's extremely intelligent and and he spends so much energy on that some of the other things is sometimes i remind him to shave you know and stuff like that it's just toby you know and, and this is back in the day and, and not 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 anything bad but um you know he would live and die and eat racing and and uh, uh once you start talking racing you figure out exactly how brilliant he is mm. um but uh yeah at first yeah it's the noodlemans are they're pig farmers. I did. It's just the way it is. <laughs> I love no it. Insult. I, I I love them all. You know. So you eventually, I guess you could say, kind of retired from racing. Do you miss it at all? Do you ever get that itch to get uh, back behind the wheel? You know, I I've done in the so so when um, I stopped racing, that was kind of a tumultuous period of my life. And my daughter was born, and and um, uh, the focus of being a family was great. Um, I miss racing and, and probably not a lot of people know this, but, but 
soon after my daughter was born, I got into really competitive RC car racing, remote control car racing. And it's a different itch that got scratched um, doing that, but it still had the same feeling of competitiveness, the technicality side of it. It was something that I was able to manage and, and do time-wise that didn't take up nearly the amount of time that, that my racing and other racing was doing. So I don't think I've ever really loved racing. Um, I did some driving schools last uh, summer for um, some road racing stuff just to see if I had fun doing it. And it was fun, but, um, you know, and I was fast. I really admit I, I was fast doing it, but I didn't, didn't see it as something I had to go do every weekend again, you know? And, and I think that just at my age, you know, I'm over 50 now. I think that, um, no, you're I am, not, you I am are over not. 50. I am over 50. Um, you know that because you were at my 50th uh, birthday. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I, I just, I don't need it anymore. Not that I wouldn't enjoy it. I, I know I enjoy it. And Toby has tried to talk me into getting in the car. Mm -hmm. and, and Danny Ferguson has talked me into getting in a car and stuff like that. But um, I don't need to do it anymore. I I, I really don't. I Because I, I know to do it right, you got to put 110% effort into it. And with how busy I am with my daughter and she's in competitive sports at school and, and work here, um, I'd be able to put in 50% effort and you get 50% results. And, and that's not, that's not who I am either. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Danny Fredrickson. I know that you've been giving some support to his son, Ty, who has really come onto the scene. What's that been like for you to kind of, hmm. kind of be that support person uh, for a young guy like that? Who's got a ton of potential. So, so Ty and, and my daughter are the exact same age, um, which, which is unique for me because I can see her being competitive in, in her sports and then, and then seeing the drive that Ty has. And um, obviously I, I love what my daughter's doing for, for what she's doing, but I can't add a lot of value to, to telling her how to play volleyball better, uh, how to be a better track star or something like that. I mean, I just, I, I, besides being a good dad that cheers her on, I, I, I don't add a lot of value that way with Ty though. Um, he's still a sponge. And, and as you know, um, father, son relationships, I'm able to probably talk to Ty a little bit differently than, than his dad can talk to him. And, and Dan and, and Ty have a great relationship, but I think I can add a little value of, of being kind of the wise old man. That's actually won some of these races that he's, he's competing in now and, and, and help him be fast. And, and I've always been friends with Dan Ferguson and, and the opportunity to, to, that he allows me to, to hang out with them and, and, and help tie is, is really a blessing because it helps me again, maybe some of my competitiveness and, um, and be a good mentor to somebody, which I think is kind of a responsibility as, as you get older, you got to mentor people and, and, and do that. I would agree with that. So tell me what has been kind of the biggest uh, standout differences that you've noticed from back when you were hmm. racing to today? Uh, the first thing is the, the young, the young racers. I mean, I mean, Ty's 15 and, yeah. and I go to the racetrack and I, I saw Jeff storm uh, this, this past weekend at the Dells. And I recalled racing Jeff before and, and Jeff's not a young guy. I'm not a young guy. Everybody else racing for the most part are young, young, young. So that's, that's a huge difference. And um, obviously the car setups and things like that are all evolved and, and different. Um, but uh, just the, the young, age of, of people racing that's and and maybe i'm maybe i'm old and just think everybody else is young that that i'm looking at but uh it certainly didn't seem like that when i was racing it was more of of that of my generation and, and older generation that that raced you know between myself and like steve holzhausen and kevin nuttleman and stuff like that i mean those guys you know steve carlson i mean i those guys don't seem to be prevalent anymore for that kind of mentorship you know, for, for in, in those series that, that at least that ties racing. And so that's a big difference. And then just the professionalism. I mean, the, the, everybody's getting recorded, everybody's working on their social media, everybody's got different programs and how they're engaging sponsors and things. Um, that wasn't very prevalent when I was racing. Yeah, that's actually, I think that's kind of been a wonderful, awful thing. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't really allow the drivers to be themselves in a way. They have to always kind of keep that sponsor. Always being recorded. Forward. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of, I think to me, I think that would probably be the biggest thing that would drive me nuts if I were in the spotlight anymore. And I'm, I'm glad I'm not so much. This, <laughs> this is about it right now for me. Uh, but also, too, you mentioned the Dells. I was going to ask you, when you go back to some of these tracks, does it conjure up memories of like when you were racing? Are you seeing things a little differently now? <laughs> what What is your take on that? Like when yeah. you went to the Dells? I, I would say that that 
the Dells, we actually told me I wanted the Dells at least a couple of times, um, which is cool. But the, when we were racing um, so much, lacrosse is probably the only spot that brings up so many memories because we raced so much of lacrosse and lacrosse was so much of a formation of, of, of where I was, um, grew up racing, um, um, these cars and, and whatnot. So these other tracks, we, we hit them, we did them, but, but when you go to lacrosse and I went to lacrosse earlier this year, um, that Wednesday night race, I think it or was the Refner, the Refner, the Refner. Yeah. 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 Um, that was, uh, both, both that's the first time I've been back in a long time. I, I, maybe since I raced there and I, I can't remember if I in between there or not, it, um, it, it brought up kind of good thoughts and also brought up kind of sad thoughts that, that I hadn't been there for a while. So, um, overall, um, that's the track that, that meant a lot. These other ones I've, I've been to Plover this summer. I went to Elko. Um, again, I raced a lot of those tracks, but nothing like lacrosse. So, so it, it kind of just when you race a lot of racetracks, they all get to be kind of the same, except for lacrosse. Lacrosse is special. I was going to say, then that was one of my questions too, was what is your favorite track? And it was lacrosse then. Huh? Yeah, it has to be, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I can't say it was the most fun to drive or the, or the, 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 the nicest place, something like that, but, but all the memories we created there, you know, so many Saturday mm -hmm. nights that, that we were there bonding as, as teammates and his family and whatnot. That, that was, that's pretty cool. Technology has changed so much. I remember going with you guys once down to the Snowball Derby, <laughs> and I had to be your scorer, like actually counting laps. And I remember being terrified to have to do that at the Snowball Derby, no less, right? <laughs> Don't mess that up, yeah. Yeah. So I'd never done that before, and I just, I think now it's like, now we all have like, what, race monitor on our phones? and that I, I can track. watch Ty's races, every race he's at, every practice session. It's, it's again, it's a whole different set of pressures. You know, because um, I'll be texting them after a session or something saying, OK, what what happened or this or that or or no, instantly it went good or bad. And 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 that's good. But again, it's you can't craft a story. The story is is broadcast for everybody, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's extra, extra pressure on guys mm -hmm. these days and gals for that matter. Mm -hmm. Um Speaking of that, there are some female racers out there. Does your daughter have any interest in racing or not too Gosh. much? I bought her a four-wheeler one year for Christmas, and she was probably five or six. Um, Robin and I went out in the front yard with her, and, and we're all excited. No snow on the ground yet, for whatever reason, one of those kind of odd Decembers. She drove it for about three laps of the yard, ran into the landscaping wall with it head on, did not get hurt. It was small. Never drove it again. <laughs> Never, never drove it. And in fact, right now she's 15 and, and, and I'm trying to get her to get her driver's license. And she's like, eh, maybe, you know, I don't know. I'll get to it, you know? And so it, it's, I, I was a kid that wanted his driver's license on, on the day of his birthday. I was already racing before I was 16, you know, like go-karts and stuff like that. So it was a little different, but uh, boy, um, no, she's not have that, that racing drive in her. I don't know for whatever reason it did not transfer. Um she's very competitive. She she loves competitive sports at school, but unfortunately not racing. Ah well we should say we're recording this on Friday, September 20th. Tomorrow the 21st is that big race up at Elko, the uh, Thunderstruck yep. 93. Um Ty Fredrickson is going to be running up there. Do you plan to be up there too for that? Uh, no, I'll be at volleyball all day tomorrow. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll keep track of it for sure using race monitor, but, um, uh, I've been trying to get as many tie races as I can, but volleyball still, uh, is the, uh, driver for, for me to, uh, to, to participate in or to be a fan of when my daughter's playing. Yeah. Are you going to get back to Oktoberfest at lacrosse? Yes. I am going to go down there one of the nights during the week for sure. That weekend, again, she's playing volleyball someplace. I don't know where. Um, but uh I, I will get down there for one of the nights just to support Ty. And and again, Oktoberfest especially, you know, my my history at Oktoberfest is pretty crazy. And um um I just again I will go down there and just see people and, and, and catch up and and just see Toby. I mean, I, I love just sitting there BSing with Toby and watching a race with Toby too. So it's those are good memories and, and I'm gonna get down there for for as much as I can of Oktoberfest. Good to hear. Good to hear. What is your favorite trophy that you ever won? Easy. It I still have it in my garage of all places. Um, 
the uh, uh, trophy that 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 Toby and I won at U.S. International Speedway um, down in Florida. I can't remember what they called that that winter race. There was a name, Speed Cup, something. Um, it was a big late model race that was, took the Northerners versus the Southerners, and and we beat Eddie Hoffman that year. I think Eddie finished second. Um, but the Northerners kind of cleaned up down there, and it made them everybody so mad. And that trophy just proved a lot to me that um, um, we had a good late model team. You know, when we can go down south and and whoop on the guys in their home track, that was that was pretty cool. And and that trophy, like I said, I, I have that in my garage, and and it's just it's it's something that 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 memory comes back and it was a, a pretty a pretty special time um that's when toby and i were really clicking and and boy did we uh we whooped on pretty good is all i won it toby had a great car toby's pit strategy was perfect and we drove away from him and and to be able to do that and their home turf down in florida that was cool indeed indeed what kind of lessons can you apply from what you've learned in your racing career to life are there any things that are transferable for how you yeah. can apply that to life? Probably a lot. Um, I've had a lot of ups and downs in life and in racing. Um, you know, racing, you're only good as your last race. You know, I mean, you won, you won this week and next week, you know, you could wreck a car. And um, it's a, it's a matter of just doing more better. I say that in, in a, a better way, but um, being more positive than negative. And if, if you are on the plus side of that, um, you're going to have a good career, no matter what you do, you know, you're gonna have a good racing career. If you can, you can be on the, in the top five more than you are in the bottom five or, or in, in racing or in life, um, you're going to be there, but you're not going to go and win every race. And that's something, even like I told Ty this summer that, that Ty won, you know, like a race right away in the spring, I can't the icebreaker or something. I, I think, and, and hope Ty listens to this and, and appreciates it. I think the attitude a little bit was, well, shit, I should be able to win them all, you know? in life, you don't win them all. <laughs> mm -hmm. You don't. And, and you just got to keep those perspective and celebrate those moments that you are amazing. And, and for the times that you aren't, you, you got to remember those and, and just work to get back there. Um, I think that, uh, racing is a very humbling thing. And, and, uh, if you approach it correctly, um, you'll be, you'll be just fine in life and racing. <laughs> Yeah, that's great advice. I saw one of those memes on social media here recently, <laughs> and it was this guy sitting on a bench talking to an owl, the wise owl. And the guy says, why is happiness so elusive? <laughs> and the owl looks at him and he says, because you're looking for it in the future instead of the present. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, yep. for sure. Yep, I believe well, it. Charlie, I appreciate you taking time. I don't want to take too much of yours. I know you're a busy guy. And Thank you've you. uh, shared a ton here tonight, and I appreciate that. Um, and I'm just so glad that you and Tobe have stayed in touch and that I can still call you my friend, too, because <laughs> I've, I've enjoyed uh, traveling with you guys, too, when you were racing. And I know Toby still has a desire to get you back behind the wheel, at least <laughs> for one more race. Yeah, I know. I, I should probably do it because life is, that's not a good lesson in life. If you don't do it, you don't get done. So <laughs> I, I got to work on that. Well, thanks so much for agreeing to come on the Racing Nuggets podcast. Thank you. Talk to you soon.